sorry why I'm running a little bit late. I'm going to keep it, uh, try and keep it on time. Um, I'm the CTO of BGW, and as James mentioned, we're over here. Uh, we're hiring people, so come have a chat to us or add us on LinkedIn if you are interested and want to have a chat. Um, I don't know, as CTO, I don't always get to work on cool problems like James, but I really like functional programming, and so this is just me having a little bit of fun uh, with the talk. And that's part of the stuff we're doing over here is running some talks. We ran dev hacks last weekend, and overall, we're enjoying being in Forest and having a bit of fun. Uh, functional JavaScript idioms. So idioms mean things that you use over and over again in a language. Uh, so I don't know, in a regular language, you might assign a variable, like var x equals something. That's an idiom. It's like more strong than a pattern. Like a pattern is something you might use in certain cases, and idiom is something you use over and over again. Functional means functions, and JavaScript means JavaScript. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, actually pulling a little bit from Richard Feldman's talk. I was thinking speaking to a couple of guys who have seen Richard Feldman's talk on why is functional programming not the norm. I'm going to start with that because it's actually a really good way to set the context for my talk. These are the top programming languages at the moment as of this year. Um, Java, C, Python are, are, are in the top. JavaScript's down at number seven, and, and there's a bunch of them in there. And Richard actually did a talk on, on, he went into the history of why these languages got so popular. And I'm gonna start with that. So one of the reasons he said that languages become popular is killer apps. So if, if a language has a killer app, uh, it becomes popular that way. So. Most people would know that the killer app for Ruby is Rails. Rails is what made Ruby take off. You know, that's why it's popular. For PHP, it's WordPress and Drupal. For C, it's systems programming, and for SQL, it's databases. Platform exclusivity is another reason why languages become popular. So, who uses Objective-C for something other than Apple development? No one. So, JavaScript also became popular this way because it was the language used in browsers. Uh, in Netscape originally. C Sharp is uh, platform, platform exclusively on Windows. Quick upgrade paths, TypeScript, remember CoffeeScript, Kotlin, C++, all kind of allow you to change the file name and you're immediately in the next language. Or you can run a little script that'll convert it to that language. So that's how some of these languages became popular. Marketing, that's, that's how Java became popular. One of the main reasons anyway, it literally like some half a billion dollars into marketing. And then slow and steady. So Python is a language which has just grown over time and now it's the most popular. Uh, someone said when I ran this talk yesterday, oh, maybe it's machine learning. Well, I don't know, it might be a catch-22. Maybe machine learning was used in Python because Python was popular by then. But if you just look at the trends, it's just slowly been going up. Probably because the language is actually good, but it's one of the few ones that is popular because the language is good. So JavaScript, let's talk about JavaScript. We're at Bucharest JS. 1995, Netscape had Brennan and Ike work on a betting scheme in Netscape browser. This was how it all started. So it was originally called Mocha and then re released as LiveScript. JavaScript was originally a functional programming language based on Scheme. Java was being marketed for half a billion dollars at the time. And Netscape wanted to be more Java-y and jumped on the bandwagon. So what did they do? Ike was tasked with dropping Scheme, forget that crap, and switch to Java syntax. Use Java syntax, and not only that, but use Java in the name somewhere, just somehow. Put it in the name, it'll all be good. All those developers who are writing Java, you know, they're gonna move over to JavaScript and it's gonna really take off, so sweet. Netscape wanted to move fast, and Ike produced the first version of JavaScript in 10 days. Interestingly, Node is in the first language or runtime to use uh, JavaScript on the server side. Netscape Enterprise Server was using JavaScript on the server side back in the 90s. This is what Java could have looked like if Ike was tasked with going ahead with Scheme and making it, and personally, I, I, I quite like this, I, I, people might disagree, but if you remove the brackets, this is like my ideal language. All the top languages are object oriented. So, a little bit of history for you. Algol was a really old language, and Simula was influenced, influenced by Algol. And Simula was one of the first languages to have classes, inheritance, objects, all this sort of stuff. Uh, 
there were seed width classes, which was based off Simula, and it was trying to make seed better because in C, uh, everything's public, so you, it ends up like a big messy soup. You, know, you can call anything at any time, and so it's pretty hard to know which thing to call at the right time. But it wasn't that that made C++ popular, it ended up getting popular by um, basically adding more features to it, and then eventually it got enough features that it became popular. Smalltalk was an object-oriented language. Uh, everything was objects, it was like the most object, some people say it's the only true object-oriented language. Uh, everything's an object, a class is an object. Uh, Objective-C was based off these and it wanted a good encapsulation. This is what this is all about, is encapsulation. Those who uh, need a refresher, encapsulation is essentially where you want to expose some things and hide others. It's also called like information hiding and things like that. You want to expose some things from your library and hide some of the like complex details of it, uh, so that the API is nice and simple. So Alan Kay invented Smalltalk, and he also coined the term object-oriented. Java wanted familiarity with classes from C++, so it like took the inheritance aspects of that and the, the classes and objects. And C Sharp wanted familiarity with Java. And so, you know, they all wanted to capitalize on the success of these other languages, so they made them look very similar. JavaScript is the same, obviously it wanted to capitalize on Java. Alan Kay actually went back and said, we've got it all wrong, object-oriented isn't exactly what I said it meant in the beginning. It's only message, only messaging, local attention, and and hiding of state process and late hiding of things. So if, although he said that, uh, Richard's kind of uh, comment is that uh, basically it doesn't matter anymore. Too bad, Alan. Uh, it means what we think it means now. There's no authority on this. You're not the authority. Where we think it means classes and inheritance and all this sort of stuff. One last one. Androids, I can't believe it's not Java language. You guessed it. Wanted familiarity with Java as well. Uh, side topic. The Android and Google case, like the sorry, the Google and Oracle case, where they said that you know, uh, the copyright issue. I actually take Oracle's side on this one. Uh, Google like purposely copied code they weren't meant to, and then you know sold it like for the pure purpose of capitalizing on Java's success. So there's like emails that actually I love this about but anyway, I won't get into that. So inheritance. This is this thing we all, all know from other programming languages. So there's actually two types of inheritance, subtyping, which is implementing an interface, and inheritance, implementation inheritance, which is extending a class. Um, we actually know now that implementation inheritance is actually not a best practice. If you've read design patterns, uh, it'll tell you that favor composition over inheritance. And I'm gonna go to use some code examples in a minute to explain why that's the case. Modern languages are sort of like know this, like Go has no inheritance has no classes, but it supports an object-oriented style. You don't need these things to be object-oriented. I want to just like use a quick example down the bottom here of what the difference looks like between like an object-oriented style and a functional style. So the top, I don't actually know how to use this. Oops, I need to do that. Uh, the, I'm just going to point. <laughs> the top uh, example is like a, a object-oriented style of doing it, and the, the second uh, line is like a functional way of doing it, where you've got like the function first, and you've got the, the object and the parameters. Whereas this has the, the class, the function, and then the parameters. There's no difference between those. This is just sy syntactic sugar, basically. Um, the only difference that can come about is this can mean something completely different if you're using inheritance. So you might be calling some random method that you don't even know about underneath the hood here be doing all sorts of things, but if you take inheritance out of the picture, these two are the exact same thing. One of the benefits of using the function, like the function form of this, is you can actually specify the exact arguments that this function needs, rather than it specifying the entire object. So it gives you a bit more information, like you're able to give it a bit more information, whereas in this, it has access to the entire book object, you don't know exactly what it's using or not. Does that make sense? Um, actually, so uh, I'm going to like talk a little bit about. Imagine you've got a stream, and it's, that's probably not large enough. How's that? A 
let's say you've got a stream and you want to do some operations on, over it. So we've got like map and filter and stuff like that over this stream. And this stream could be doing anything. It could be uh, reading from an email stream, reading off the TCP stream or anything like that. So we want to apply uh, like take. So take is basically you've got a stream. You just take the first n or like the first three elements from it. In this case, I'm using a number stream. So it's like one, four, six, two, nine. And take would essentially take the first three numbers from that stream. In inheritance world, like if we're using inheritance, basically what we would do, we have this number stream with the array that we're talking about. This is TypeScript, by the way. And we would extend the number stream so that you know we, we have the, the same numbers, but we also take this number, uh, this uh, parameter n. And when we go to fetch, basically we take the first n numbers, which is what all this is doing. We assign those first three to the numbers thing, and then we call the super dot fetch, which essentially just returns the numbers. Let's say we want to filter and take the numbers from the stream. So same sort of thing. Now we're extending the take number stream. So now we've got three layers of hierarchy. I already sort of see where this is going. So now we've got fetch, and now we do const ls, and then we basically filter um, based on the, the operation that we're provided. So we do the filtering here. We assign the filtered numbers here, and then we call super.fetch, which will go to the take number thing. It'll run this, and then it'll call super.fetch, and then it'll return the numbers here. So now we've got filter and take. We've joined those two things together. And then we can do console.log, filter and take. We've got the stream of numbers here, one, two, three, four, five, up to 10. We take the first three, and we filter based on which is greater than five. Any questions on that? Does that, that kind of make sense? going on there. All right, cool. So this, it, what, I'm, what I'm proposing is, although this is a little bit of a contrived example, um, imagine that the number stream is instead, uh, like we're sending emails, right? And instead of take, we've got like encrypt email. And instead of filter, we've got like convert email to a binary format or something like that. And now we've got this inheritance where it's like email, email with encryption, email with encryption, and binary. So like, Although you might not expect to use this for this particular example, there's other ex very similar examples people have where they end up doing it like this. So, yeah, and it does run and it does work. So let me just, uh, I run that, I get back six, seven, eight. So it's filtered the ones greater than five, like I expected, and then taken the first three. Okay. Let's have a look at composition and what that looks like. One of the things you'll see here is that filter and take requires like an inheritance thing. Anyway, I'll, I'll come back to that. Composition. So we've got a number stream again. It takes a list of the operations you want to do on it now, and then you fetch it by applying all those operations. So the operations applied here with the list, and then we return the list. Now let's have a look at what our take looks like. So we've got take. All we do is, that's the number we want to actually take, so that's the first three, first five, whatever. We get given a list of numbers, and then we take the first n number of those and return it. So there's no, uh, and this just implements an interface, there's no connection with take operation and the above thing, which is basic number stream. Basic number stream gets given a take operation, but take operation doesn't know anything about Filter is very similar. And I've added a map in here as well. So let's have a look how it comes out with composition instead of inheritance. So we have stream. So we have basic number stream. We do a map times everything by two. We do a filter, i is greater than five. We do a take of the first three. So if we have all the one, one, two, three, again, we do stream.fetch. What we get back is Six, eight, ten. So that makes sense because we've times everything by two in this example. We've gone greater than five in the first three. So six, eight, ten makes sense. Um, I think there's a lot of advantages over the composition approach. For example, if I want to switch these two uh, things and do this, I actually don't know what this will come out as. Your quick amounts, right? Twelve, forty, sixteen. Okay, cool. Because it's taken the first. 
by what's greater than five and then times it by two and taking the first three. So that's cool. So you can do that. Whereas in the inheritance example, let me flip back to that. You kind of stuck with the order that you've written it in in the inheritance chain. Um, if you want to understand more about that, try like implementing this example yourself. At home. I'm going to work, I'm going to make this a little bit better. So I've got composition to a my example. So I've got the same basic number string um, as you can see here, exactly the same. That hasn't changed. I've got s take. I've just renamed it because it's in the same thing. Um, s take. So that takes a number. It, it also takes numbers, the list, and then it computes it and returns it. So all I've done is turn these into functions using the uh, arrow notation, which is a little bit more functional. So these are just functions now. They're not classes anymore works the exact same way. There's really no difference to it. It's just a little bit more concise. I don't have as much code anymore. So now let's have a look. I've got my basic number stream. I've got the numbers at the start. It looks exactly the same. I've got map, filter, take. There's no difference. All I've got now is a little bit more conciseness and less code, which is cool. Now let's have a look a little bit more functional. So I've removed the basic number stream now. So there's no class with the, at the top. I've got take, filter, map, exactly the same. And now all I've got, instead of that uh, 20 line uh, basic number stream class, I've got f apply. And all that apply does is it takes a list of operations, like the number stream did, reduces them by applying them and giving the initial list of numbers. This looks almost exactly the same as the last example, except I call f apply instead of uh, instantiating a class now. So exactly the same, just more terse, less code. So let me just run that, and you know what it's going to come out as. It's the exact same thing, but just in case. Alright, so taking it one step further, so now that we've got that, everything's a function, and I've got this like apply thing now, what I can do is I can actually write, and this is sort of what I'm getting to, is you've got map filter thing in your base JavaScript language anyway. Um, so it's a little bit contrived example. You wouldn't do this because you've already got those functions. But if you do do this uh, with different things like the email example I told you about, what you can now do is, you, or you can allow other people to now come up with functions that you can plug into this. So I've come up with this primes, so G primes here. So basically, it's the same as filter, uh, but for all the numbers, only if it's prime am I going to push it on and then return it. So it filters out based on which ones are and basically down here, I've got now the primes after filtering greater than five, taking three. What I've then done is I've basically uh, used the filter function instead of doing it this way. So now in this new primes function, I've got filter is prime and given the numbers, which the numbers I've provided here. So this is more terse. I'm reusing the functions I've already got, which is kind of neat because um, get into why that, that's uh, possible later. Then I've got, look, these numbers things don't really matter. I'm plugging them in, but then I'm not really doing anything with them. So now I can remove that. I've got I primes is just filter with the is prime function. And now I can plug that in and get a result. So it gives a seven. Um, remember, I've only got 10 things in begin with, so filtering greater right than five, and taking the first three, or whatever amount there is, there's only one part there. Okay, cool. So that's uh, composition over inheritance. You might have heard that. It's actually, JavaScript, I think, kind of made it popular again. So what is functional programming? We've seen a little bit of it already in JavaScript. But maybe it's whatever you want it to be, because no one has a definition for what it actually is. All these languages are so like meshed now that you kind of can make it whatever you want to be. There's no authority on it, just like there's no authority on object-oriented programming. But if you ask me, it's about first-class functions. And a first-class function is a function where you don't need anything else. It's just like it's there, and in JavaScript, it does offer that. You have a function without having a class or it has an emphasis on purity, immutability, and managing side effects. Does anyone know, uh, like, what, can, 
Can someone give me an example of a side effect? Yo. Writing to the console, yep. Reading from a file, yep. All, all these things are definitely side effects. Good job, guys. So even console.log changes some state in your computer. It changes the state of what's on the screen. So that's a side effect. Anything that makes a change outside of the function is a side effect. Purity and immutability is about managing side effects, basically. So the, this is top of mind in functional programming. We're going to see why it's top of mind in a second. Um, there's separation of data and logic. So you know in your class you have your fields and then you have your methods. These are kept completely separate in functional programming languages. And emphasis on scalar data types and collections. So scalar data, the primitive types, in, integer like numbers and, and things like this. And collections, so putting these into collections of things like lists and arrays and things. So it, it does this stuff without creating objects and classes. Um, then when you've got this, uh, you can have all kinds of functions running on top because any programmer who's writing a library knows what a collection of numbers looks like. Uh, and an emphasis on, emphasis on function composition. We've already seen a little bit of what function composition actually is already. It's about putting together functions and collecting. Pure functions. So this is really the crux of what I'm talking about. One of the cruxes of what I'm talking about today. They have referential transparency. So a pure function is like a function where given the same inputs, you always get the same output, outputs. So for example, the add function, if you give add one and five, it will always return six. It's never gonna return eight or nine or anything like that. The second rule is that they're a side effect free. So no side effects uh, are caused by the function. It doesn't do a console.log. Console.log probably isn't the most important example, but like reading or writing files or reading or writing to the database, uh, the ones that we really care about. Where did functional programming come from? So it's it's interesting because if you go back in time to the 1930s, Alonzo Church was working with Alan Turing. We all know Turing because Turing is uh, invented the Turing machine. Um, he was also a, a really important part of cracking uh, some crypt cryptography and, and there's a movie about him now, so everyone knows who he is. Uh, Turing invented the Turing machine. His mentor, his coach was Alonzo Church. I think I would have really liked, I'm quite jealous of Turing, actually. I would have liked to have Church as my mentor. Church invented Lambda Calculus, which was actually the first Turing complete language, which is interesting because it was invented before the Turing machine. The Turing machine works like you got a tape and then you're like, basically you got a state table. You got a tape, you're looking at the zeros and ones. Based on the zeros and ones, you're plugging it into your state table, coming up with a new thing, moving the uh, pointer right or left, and writing to the tape at the same time. It's quite involved, it's quite complicated. If you haven't tried it already, I would recommend just have, trying to like write a program in it. In Lambda Calculus instead though, there's only three ways to create Lambda expressions. So the first one, you have x, a variable. The second one, you have a function. And the third one, you apply the function. We can all understand what that is. We know variables, we know functions, we know how to call them. That, that's it. That's Turing complete, in fact. And it's mathematically proven to be so. One of the weird things about this, you might be thinking, is there's no numbers or anything. Like, how do I have a number? Because there's no assignment. You can't go x equals 1. It's not a rule in the language. All you need is these three rules. Mathematicians like to keep things as simple as possible. So what Church did, he didn't want to introduce another rule. So instead, what he had is this thing on the right over here. And they're called church new rules. Basically, a number is a function call. So the number one is one function call. Number two is two function calls, etc. That's how, basically, and you translate that. So when you see two function calls, you translate that to the number two. And now you can actually read it or write a program in it and have it run and it actually works. There's a couple of examples of functions. I'm not really going to go into the math, like the details of these, but they're they're actually quite simple once you understand the syntax. It looks kind of weird, um, but suck is just plusing one. So, and it pluses one because you can see one extra function call outside of the f and x. And basically, adding one more function call to this is a plus one. In this one, we've got plus. So we've got plus of m and n. 
and we're doing we're doing this plus one again, but we're doing it m times. So n plus one m times is n plus m. And over here you have multiplication, so you have m and n. We're reusing this plus thing, so imagine that you take that and you plug it in there, and now you have uh, plus n m times, which is multiplication. So again, this is a little bit of history for those who are kind of have the mathematical mindset, but you might want to read up on this a little bit later. But this is where functional programming came from. It forked off from Turing machines in the 1930s, and there's languages based on this, and there's languages based on the Turing machine, and these are the two kind of classifications that we have today. JavaScript has functional features, although Ike ditched Scheme, there's still some functional features, because obviously he liked functional programming as well. There's first class functions, there's using pass functions around, uh, which is kind of cool. Anonymous, you can return functions, you can pass them as arguments. Um, we have pure base functions, which is unusual. So map, filter, reduce, concat, they're all pure functions. We have closures and things like that. So clearly there's some, there's, there's some parts of this that, that have left over that aren't like, that he didn't completely turn it into Java. There's some functional aspects that have remained and passed through the language. Example use, industry use, so functional programming languages are normally uh, some of the cases you might know. Uh, distributed computing, so WhatsApp uses Erlang to manage all its messages. The complex domains, if you have really complex business logic, you'll see it in here. Parallelization, MapReduce came from functional programming. High write reliability, so Erlang in Ericsson's systems ran at nine nines availability. Uh, well, I could lucky to get four with anything that we do these days. Uh, research, so Haskell is used in compiler research and emerging language features like in JavaScript, but also in these other languages. So some functional idioms. Why do we want to do this? Well, because it's coming to an application near you soon. Uh, these features, some of them are in JavaScript already, some of them are coming with libraries, some of them are actually have proposals to become part of the base language itself. I'm going to run through a couple of these and see what they actually look like. So first one is tail recursion. We have a factorial function. So uh, for those who can't remember factorial, is basically you take a number, if it's 0 or 1, re return 1, and then we multiply by every number below that to get the, the sum. That's actually, it's pretty hard to explain when you look at it, the, the traditional JavaScript way of doing it. Uh, imagine trying to explain this to a kid. It's not going to make a lot of sense. In Haskell, it looks like this. Factorial of 0 is 1. Anything else, factorial of anything else, is n times the factorial of n minus 1. Now we can explain it a bit easier. This is one of the things that functional programming is known for, is to make code more readable. If we had tail recursion in JavaScript, so tail recursion is, notice here that we've got this call to itself, and you know, if you call yourself too many times, you're going to blow the stack, right? You get the stack exception that exceeded limit. That sucks. Functional programming languages, you can do this and you're not going to blow a stack if you call it on the end. And, and the reason is, is because it has tail call optimization, which basically means it turns this into a for loop under the hood. Right? So you don't have to write the for loop, you can do uh, what you can call yourself um, and it will just turn it into a for loop in the compile level. Imagine JavaScript for a moment, like just imagine that it had uh, tail, tail recursion or tail call optimization. Now we have if n equals 0, return 1, otherwise return n times factorial of n minus 1. Interestingly enough, the ES2015 spec has tower recursion as a feature. Um, however, it's not implemented in any browsers. So if I was to make a bet, I would bet that this would be possible sometime in the future. JavaScript with tower recursion and path matching, which is the other thing that we're, we're looking at here. Now we can have two functions. One is factorial that takes a zero. Whenever a factorial is called with zero, we get a one. Whenever a factorial is called with anything else, we get this thing that we've seen before. That's path matching, so it knows which function to actually call based on the input arguments. There's much more powerful versions of path matching. So the second example I've got is 
Uh, there's actually a proposal for JavaScript to get pattern matching, so coming to an application near, near you soon, uh, we have pastes, which is our, our pattern match. And then when it, the object res from our fetch looks like this, it has a status and the headers with content length of variable. Then we can say size is that variable. So it knows it matches the object structure. It does like basically an equals on this in a, in a more clever way. And then it looks at if you get a status 404, we can say that it's not found. Or if it's anything else greater than 400, we get this will come in handy in React as well. Um, now you can look at an object and see if it's got a loading property on it. And if it does, you can print loading. If it has an error property on it, we can print an error. And if we have a data property, we can print some data. So yeah, there's other examples of this. Look it up if you're interested. One of the other uh, idioms is, is tuples. So uh, yeah, we have this object here. So we've got field names and field values. User ID, one, two, three, etc. We can do deconstruction in JavaScript. This, this came you know, fairly recently, a couple of years ago, but fairly recently. With tuples, you don't actually need to specify the field names. You get kind of an array, but not. One, two, three, name balance. And we just we can use types to make sure that they are actually the right types. And then we can deconstruct that that way. You basically remove the field names. It actually comes in handy when you're returning like a value and an error. Python, Python has tuples, so you can read user and then you can return user and error if there is one and deconstruct it like that without specifying all the field names and all that kind of stuff. Burritos. So burritos are monads. There's a big chunky code here, don't worry about that. Basically all you have to look at is this either. So either.write is one way of calling it. Either.write means that the function succeeded and we're going to return a value. Either.left means we, we screwed up, something screwed up, and uh, we're going to return an error. And the cool thing about this is that throwing an exception here uh, would mean that if you're looking at the function, you don't actually know what's going to happen. Right? It, there could be some exception buried in it somewhere deep in its call stack that you don't know about. But with this, Basically, it comes up to uh, be like a type in TypeScript. So you can see that the type is either. So you know immediately by looking at the function signature that you could get back an error, which is a string, or this object, which is the value. So when you use it, you can call the function, apply credit command. And then you can do this Carter thing where you extract the error and the value. Imagine this doing this in like a try catch you don't even know what exceptions are being thrown. Uh, there's a whole class of problems that this solves. So that's kind of interesting. The library I'm using here is called Monet. Uh, I, I find it the simplest functional library out there. And it has, that's where these either's come from. It has either and maybe and a couple other things, but they're the main ones. I, I like keeping it simple. Lazy evaluation. So uh, let's say we have X and we create a list which is from zero to infinity. And then we've got this infinite list in our memory, and then we times it by two, and then we take all the things that divide by three. Um, in some languages, this actually works. You don't run out of memory with this infinity. What it does is it only computes values uh, when you actually go to call them. That's laziness. When you look at stream processing and things like that in JavaScript, it's already doing things like this. Parallelization. So when you've got pure functions, you can parallelize things. This is a C sharp example. So you can, if you've got pure functions like select and stuff like that to upper, it will take this list of names and process them in parallel, converting all the names to uppercase. Software transaction. I'm not going to go into that next to one. Uh, currying. So JavaScript has currying. This is a functional feature. So you can take an X, which returns a function that takes a Y, and then it um, so you can, so you, let's say we have add, x and y. So if you have add 5 and you call add with 5, add 5 is now a function. And if you call add 5 with 3, you get back a. That's currying and it's, it's quite useful because it creates more reusable functions. Memoization is like caching. This is a Python example. Basically, if you have Fibonacci uh, a sequence, like the function Fibonacci, and that's a pure function, so 
the same input, same outputs. You just chuck this at LRU cache on the top. Don't worry about it, and it just caches everything now. Whenever you call that function, you call it again with the same numbers. It's already cached, it doesn't run that whole function. So you can just chuck that on the top. JavaScript doesn't have this, but you can basically implement it if you want uh, as a library. Immutable data structures. Um, so there is immutable JS, which is immutable data structures for JavaScript. Immutable data structures you call like set and add and push and all that stuff on it, but it doesn't change the underlying structure. It basically what it does, it returns a new one, completely brand new, and, and it does it that way. Kind of like map filter and like concat and everything like that in JavaScript. But this is for everything, like every map operation. I kind of rec recommend, although there's Facebook's library immutable JS, I kind of recommend not using it. I've just found that uh, like if you look at the underlying code, it's super, super complicated. Um, and I've just found uh, I'd rather use JavaScript's native features to do basically the same thing or, or get around it somehow. I just found it not worth it. But it is kind of cool, and you should check it out if you're interested. And then closures. JavaScript has closures as well. Again, functional concept. So when I've got a function f, this is another Python example. And I define another function g, and which returns x plus y, and then I return g, that's a closure. All a closure is basically is a function where it's using a variable that's outside of the function. That's basically it. So when you've got a closure, it's basically storing that function, but also the environment that it's coming from, and it has a bit more context. Um, and JavaScript has these, because you can essentially write this exact same code in JavaScript. Cool. So there's some idioms, and as you can see, JavaScript already have like a lot of them. Uh, there's a couple I didn't mention, runtime type features, like I'm expecting TypeScript to maybe add some of these and make it a bit easier. There's MapReduce and there's Actors, but I'm not going to cover those, you can read up uh, on your own time. Okay, so I'm going to just write a little bit of code now, and the purpose of the code is really to show how to refactor a function. Um, but do it with pure functions, like kind of with some of these concepts in mind. Okay, so basically I've got this function, check subscriptions. Check subscriptions finds all the users in the database, and then it creates an expired users. I think we're trying to look for expired users, people who haven't paid uh, when they were supposed to. So if they're on the monthly plan, and they haven't paid in a month, they're expired. We gotta, we gotta note that down. If they're on the yearly plan and they haven't paid in less than a year, then they're expired. We push them onto that list. And then for all the expired users, we send them an email. Does that make sense so far? Any questions on that? Pretty, pretty simple, but we're gonna try and, I mean, the, the problem with this is, imagine trying to write a test for this. So now you've got, You've got to set up some state in the database first. You've got to populate all that users table. Uh, then you've got to try and hit this for condition. And then you've got to try and hit this if condition, all the if conditions. And then you've got to mock out this send expired email thing. So you're not even testing that because you're not sending an email. So testing this is a bit hairy. So let me have a crack at refactoring this and we'll see if we can extract something that is actually able to be tested. Most people might know where this is going, but let's have a look. Basically what I want to do is if I look at the value, the value is the user, and the logic is around whether they're expired. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a function called is user expired, which takes a user. I'm just going to say they're ready for now. And it's going to return whether the user is expired. So that's this part of the code here. And when it hits this condition, it's actually true. And same with this one. Otherwise, they're not expired. Okay, so now I can dump that stuff. I'm not going to use that anymore. So but I've got these users, and I'm going to map them over this is expired function. Except I'm going to filter it because I don't want the users that I 
have not expired. And now I can basically do the same thing. So I can get that. Okay, cool. If I want to make it a little bit more functional for whatever reason, uh, if your team has chosen to kind of use functional kind of features, uh, paradigm and, and things like that as well, including the syntax, I'm going to for each this this isn't functional at all, but I'll just make the, the uh, code look cursor. So we can read it easier. Okay, the refactoring's done. So let's see if I can close that up. There we go. That's better. So I've got this function now, which is takes a user and returns true or false. And I've got these functions now, which reads the users, filters them, and then sends them an email for those that are expired. This is, I, I think this is a really good way to refactor code. One thing that you'll notice here is this is now really simple, but this is the high risk stuff because your database could be in any state at all, like it could be offline for all we know. Um, so keeping this really simple and keeping it line by line without any statements or any logic or anything like that I think is good and also we've got this sending an email thing and emails again like the email server can be offline or whatever so this function I'm keeping it simple because I want to know what it's doing it's high risk and I, I just want to make sure that it's just super simple and straightforward this function on the other hand is getting more complicated and now imagine that you're in a real life scenario you've got these all, all these other conditions this function is going to grow larger and larger and get really complicated that's fine because it's a pure function and I can test it really easily. This function, I can't test. You want to make sure that the complex stuff uh, is somewhere you can test it. You want to make sure the high risk stuff is somewhere where it's simple because you can't test it easily. <coughs> okay, so uh, I'm just going to write a quick test for this. So I expect is user expired. I give it a user that is on the plan of the yeah. Sorry about that. Thanks for that, man. Last page. Let's go. that's plus one, then I expect it to be expired. And that test should work. When I give those values in production to that same function, I should expect that exact same return value every single time, no matter what state my database is in, no matter what state my email server is in. Now I can write copy and paste that test, and I can write a test for every other case, when it's minus one month, when it's yearly, whatever the case may be. So that's kind of cool. So now I can test this properly, easily, now imagine that the business person comes to you with a feature. What's that feature request likely to change? Are they going to change your database model? Maybe sometimes, but it's probably not going to change this plan or last page. Is it going to change the email uh, server sending logic? Probably not. What it's probably going to change is something in this function. Maybe uh, like one example is if you have VIP customers, you never want to uh, see them expired. So what you can do is you can go uh, and user.vip doesn't equal true. And I've got that, and I can add it to my test now. And that test should still run. So now I've, I've changed stuff like very easily. I, I don't have to worry about mocks or anything like that. So I think one key, key concept is that this function is pure, and when you have pure functions, it's great for putting complex logic in. It's really easy to test. That's basically the example. I'm glad I got to the end of this without uh, looking like an actor who's forgot their lines in the front of an audience. It's cool. Alright. So that's boundaries because the boundary is on the value, which is the user. So there's actually, rather than uh, just the code, it's useful for code structure. Functional program is really useful for code structure and it's also used for architecting your uh, whole system. 
we see that uh, because the goal is to take advantage of purity. In architecture, if you're designing a system, look at what is pure and what's not. Where are the effects? Where's the state? Uh, where's your business logic? And keep that in top of mind when designing an architecture. I'm not going to tell you exactly how to design every architecture, but if you keep those things in mind, you'll definitely come out with a better architecture. One architecture that does this is Flux. As, as we all know, I'm going to show you some diagrams in a second. There's others out there. Look at event sourcing, CQRS, and DDD if you want to know a little bit more about that. Remember the jQuery style of doing things where you have like this controller and then you have all these models and those models like read and then write to the DOM and like update it and change it all the time while these other models are doing the same thing. That really sucked. Do you remember what was before this? What was before jQuery and Ajax? It was uh, HistoryJS. HistoryJS was when you had the state of your application in the URL bar. And you could only have like a state of up to like 2048 characters because that's how much a URL bar took up. But that's how, how we used to write programs like a couple of decades ago. Um, and then we moved to jQuery when Ajax came about where you could do all these things in the client side but it was a little bit trickier because all had all these things going on at once. Then we uh, encountered Flux, which is, in essence, a functional architecture, I think. You have actions that come into a dispatcher. The actions are just objects. They're just plain pieces of data. The dispatcher is dumb. All it does is fire events. The stores and reducers are complicated, but they take in an event. They're pure functions. Right? They take in an event. They output your state. So they take in an event, the current state. They output the new state. And then your views are also dumb. They're just views based on your uh, store, what's, what the state is in your store. And the views can fire actions, which go through the exact same flow. So this is a functional architecture. And you see a lot of domains that are quite complicated looking like this, I think. And uh, this came about from Facebook when they had a problem with their notifications. You know, in Facebook, you're looking at your phone, and it's got like one notification, but you've already checked it. You check it again, it's like, ah, oh, notifications. That's actually how they invented, or well, one of the reasons they invented this architecture, because the things on the front end were getting so complicated. They needed some way to like do this without introducing bugs. They had all these different uh, programmers changing stuff on the front end. So just a quick wallet example. So basically, uh, users have, have accounts. So they have account balances. Accounts have three balances. Uh, in our casinos, gold coins, sweeps cash, and sweeps uncashable. Gold and sweeps are independent currencies. The last two, the sweeps cash and the sweeps uncashable, kind of relate to each other. When you have cashable sweeps deducted before uncashable sweeps, uh, sorry, when you have a command come in, the cashable is deducted first. Commands come in to add or deduct gold and sweeps from accounts, and it looks like this, very similar to the Flux architecture. So we've got commands coming in to a log, we log them sequentially. We have the business logic in the reducer and then the read model at the end. We query the read model for things. Very similar to Flux. Looks like this. So commands come in. We have add 10, subtract 5, add 1, subtract 2. The reducer reads all, like pulls all of those out of the database in, in order because they're ordered in the database. It goes through them one at a time and computes the new state. So the reducer is a pure function. If you have subtract 15 here, you can't subtract 15 because you only got 10 in the, in the account. That's still logged, but the reducer will know that it's not a proper command and it will tell you that it wasn't able to process it. We still log it, which is kind of cool because we know someone tried to do that somehow. So there's probably a bug in our application somewhere. So, taking an example, we have two commands come in, add 10, subtract 5. The reducer takes those, computes the balance, 10 minus 5 is 5, and puts a bookmark at number 2, which is here. Two more commands come in. Rather than processing those ones again, it reads what it last wrote, which was balance 5, bookmark 2, so it knows the start from here. And it reads every other command that's come in, computes the new balance, which is 4, and adds a bookmark for number 4. That's basically how it works. There's a little bit more to it, but it's pretty simple at the end of the day. The cool thing about the reducer is, given an input, and like input is the, the bookmark plus the events, it will always produce the same outputs. 
So uh, just to show you some of the code quickly. Basically I've got this project where I've got the routes coming in. So like I've got a credit route. I've got the database stuff, which is pulling saving commands to a Mongo database. And I've got the domain logic, which is quite hairy, but again, it's all pure functions. I'm not going to go into that really, but I'll just run the test to show you what kind of tests we've got. So we've got uh, should respond 404, should respond with 100. So we're basically sh shoving commands into this thing and checking we get the right balances out of it. All right. The cool thing about this, exactly the same as my uh, boundaries example, where's the, where's the high risk stuff in here? The high risk stuff is the routes, because the routes could be pulling literally anything off the wire. Users could be sending you all kinds of garbage. So that's high risk. The database is high risk, again, because it could be in a completely weird state of production. Maybe you can't test it easily. Um, there's all kinds of consistency, there's locking, there's all sorts of stuff going on in literally any database you use. The domain where the pure functions are is the low risk stuff. So this architecture, what it does, uh, when it does anything, is it reads stuff from the database, then sends all that stuff to the domain, and, and then returns it to the user. The way that I've architected it, exactly the same as pulling those pure functions out, that refactoring exercise. If you use this architecture, it'll support that, what you'll find is that your high risk stuff, the database and the routes, end up really small and simple. And then your domain ends up really large, complex, but really easy to test. And, and you can see that if you're thinking about purity and you split stuff up like that, that, that's what you want. So when should you use this? Probably not all the time. Um, probably if you're writing like a very simple product application or just showing some transactions on a screen. Maybe not when doing a talk. You can use it when doing a talk. You can, when you have high write throughput and or high contention situations, kind of like the jackpot that James was talking about. And I think if we were designing that today, we might do something similar to this. But it's also used in uh, FX trading, like sports betting, etc. If you are interested in it, look at LMAX. LMAX is a trading platform based on this architecture. When all history is required, if you've got every single event in your database, you can go back and see whatever happened at whatever point in time. If you need to rebuild reports from scratch from two years ago, you can do that. Very complex domains, it works well. And when there's distribution required, like uh, conflict-free uh, replicated data types, where you're, you've got like basic data structures, like map and list and all that, and you want to distribute it on a lot of different machines, or graphs even. Or if you need to replay all those events as well. So you can pull up all those events and replay and find out where that bug is. So in summary, uh, some general advice. Optimize for readability. Um, this is really key. So although I've taught you all these really cool patterns and things, the most important thing in your application is that your teammates can read it. So don't throw all these things at your problem at once. Discuss with your team. Figure out what's going to be the easiest for everyone to read. Obsess over the problem, not the solution. That's one thing I took from James's talk is people are like, yeah, throw Redis at this problem, it'll work. But if you obsess over the problem and then you find the solution that's going to fit that problem perfectly, you'll never end up with that problem. Think about architecture in terms of purity, side effects, and state. This is really key if you want to uh, build a highly robust system. Separate logic from effects. Uh, look at other options before jumping into inheritance pretty much all the time. If you have a complex domain or strict performance requirements, check out DDD and event command sourcing. Uh, that's it. Thanks very much. Does anyone have any questions? Yep.
Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, you never get pure, purely functional with anything we're doing. So, uh, what I would suggest is using pure functions, because pure functions you can do without any of the other stuff. You can just do it with your current application. Literally any language, you can just pull out a pure function. If you do that, there's no real performance overhead. It's part of your language already. So, um, I like keeping the code simple because actually simple code is the easiest to optimize for performance as well. Yeah. Any other questions? Yep. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so yeah. On the front end, you're, you're absolutely right. So a lot of people are like trying to look at the micro, they look at micro benchmarks, you know, when you just pump like hit uh, the, your React and uh, it's all like other frameworks like on every individual command. Most expensive thing you can do on the front end is to write to the DOM, right? So if you can reduce the number of writes to your DOM, then you're going to be what, like 10 times better than if you're trying to optimize these little operations. And that's what React does through functional programming. Can calculate the delta between what you're doing and what is there, and minimize the operations uh, to your goal. Any other questions? Yep. Oh. All right, cool. Look, guys, thanks for uh, it's been a long night, but thanks so much for coming. I hope you all learned something out of this and enjoyed the talks in particular. Thanks very much.